Thanks for showing up today, everybody. Um, I'm here. My name is Ian Walsh. I'm with Hard Money Bankers. As many of you know, we're doing Masters of the Market where we're working uh, and discussing with experts. We're seeking them out in our local Philadelphia, New Jersey markets and so forth. Actually, some of these guys are national. And today we are uh, joined with a guy who has a, you know, a fantastic business model, a lot of experience in the business, has been around the game uh, about the same amount of time that I have. His name is Brian Mara. Many of you may already know him. He's got a big personality on him and um, really welcome to, have, uh, welcome to have you today, Brian. I appreciate you coming on. You got it, man. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Good. So um, today's, today we're going to talk about a couple things. Brian is, is uh, what I would consider an expert in a couple different areas. Really fantastic marketer uh, of his own, on his own right, but that's not typically what we're, or what we're going to go after today. Today I wanted to talk about, first I know Brian, tell us, you started in short sailing, your game has evolved to other things, and you really, really were doing a ton of deals back in 2008 and so forth. So give us a little background uh, to you and where things are and where they're going with you right now. Sure. So in 2007, I was coming off of a divorce and I needed some money. I went out and got my real estate license in New Jersey in PA. And at the time, short sales were starting to pop up and nobody really wanted to deal with them. Um, I guess they knew better. I didn't know any better because I was brand new. So I started taking them because that's frankly the only business I could get. And I developed a niche for it. So as an agent for two years, I really just focused primarily on short sales. And that was 2007 and eight. And then what happened was during that time, I started working with a lot of investors and people were flipping these short sales, making incredible money. And I, I realized that I go to a closing and I would make five, 6,000 on a commission as a listing agent. And this guy or girl is flipping the house, making 50 or 60 grand. And so I wanted to become an investor. I just didn't know how. So I decided to stick with short sales and I started learning through different online courses and things of that nature, how to flip short sales and be an investor. And things changed in 2010 when Countrywide, you know, back then, Bank of America came out with a restriction on the resale. And they basically said, okay, flippers, you can flip your short sale, but you got to hold it for 30 days now. Well, we were doing same day flips and there was no restrictions on it back then. Sure. Well, the problem, Ian, is that I had over 100 deals in my pipeline. We were doing five, 10 deals a month at that time. And I was pretty much facing being out of business because we were using transactional funding, the dough for a day, right? Yep. And they weren't going to give me that money for 30 days. So I ended up partnering with uh, one of the nation's best attorneys in regards to this area. And we created a system. We created a way how to legally wholesale a short sale, working with the bank with their blessing and approval. And it worked so well that we ended up creating a product teaching others how to do that. Um, that was called Flip Free Profits. We had a 2.0. We sold thousands and thousands of copies of that. Next thing I knew, I was doing coaching for people and helping them and flying all around the country and uh, doing deals everywhere. So we collectively have done over a thousand deals since I started. Um, quite a bit of experience. That's a lot. Yeah. Masters of the market. That makes sense. You're, I mean, an expert in your well, area. Sure. We've done it and, and we're still doing them. So to kind of tell you where I'm at today, yeah. uh, we are still doing short sales. We're not doing anywhere near as many. Number one, because the market doesn't have as many of them, but there are certain pockets um, specifically in Houston, in Baltimore, Delaware, northern New Jersey, where there's still a lot of short sales, a lot of inventory, a lot of distressed properties. And so we've, we've, we're still working them. We're just more selective now, and we can be. So uh, that's kind of a good thing, but we're still doing them. Gotcha. So let me ask this then. Um, if you had if you done a lot of short sales, I know you think you were in the game around 2008 as well, right? Right, right. So yep. what have you seen when you get to watch a full real estate cycle? So what have you seen from then Till now, where we're going, what have you seen? Some of the telltale signs is something we have always discussed with a lot of different people watching the cycle, right? Right. Well, it's really interesting because looking back, you know, in 2007, that's before the bubble officially burst, right? And that happened in 08. So I guess looking back, I kind of had a heads up on that. I didn't know it at the time, but sure. you know, all these people falling into default and these short sales were creeping up. I don't think anybody knew what was going to happen a year later when it did. Um, obviously with the loss of equity and the crash and all that, they were, they were everywhere. I mean, I remember in my office in Princeton, um, at some points, 30, 35% of every new listing that came out was a short sale in other offices around the country. Uh, some offices were pulling 60, 70% of every new listing was a short sale. So it was a boom time, right? And that right. lasted quite a few years. And then a few years ago that started shifting, that started changing where equity started coming back in most, a lot of areas, let's say. And so the short sales really stopped. I don't want to say they stopped coming around because they never will, right? And I tell people that all the time, oh, short sales are dead. Really? Well, until people stop getting divorces and getting sick and losing their jobs, you're, you're always going to have reason for a short sale. 
And the two primary reasons for a short sale is that you have negative equity, right? You owe more than the house is worth and you're behind on payments. You're in some stage of default. So what we've actually been doing recently is changing the model is helping people. See, let me explain it like this. I always would tell people, because I have a whole questionnaire and there's 14 questions and we analyze comps to see if it's a good deal to be a short sale. But I always started with this. When people would approach me with a potential deal, I'd say, well, it has to have two parameters. And if it doesn't have these two, I can't help you. Not now. Mm. It has to have negative equity and it has to be behind on payments. Well, that's changed. So since the equity has come back, we've actually been creating a new method right now where we're, we're working with high equity short sales. High equity, I should call them pre-foreclosures. And here's why. See, a lot of times people do have a large amount of equity in their home, but they run into a financial crisis and they can't make the payments anymore. So yes, they're in default. Yes, they're risking losing their home, but they have equity. Sure. Well, that's not a short sale, right? You can't mm -hmm. approach the bank for a discount when they see this equity spread. So the short sale is not an option. So where this specifically works is where people still want to stay in their home. They don't want to leave. They don't want to uproot their children. They just can't afford the house anymore. So through some different funds that we've created and are working with, we're actually going in restructuring the loan, buying the house from them and leasing it back to them. Now, in a standard short sale, you could never do that. They have to leave the premises, right? When you right. do short sale, they have to vacate. Well, because a short sale never took place, the bank's being paid off in full because of the equity position. We're able to keep the people in their home, and depending on the situation between a 12 to 24-month period, sell it back to them. So we're able to profit with some of the equity. And no, sometimes people, I ask them, well, that's equity stripping. Really? No, it's not because mm. we're taking a portion for our service and allowing them to stay in the home and – you know, again, with the intention of a lease back, sell, selling it back to them in, uh, you know, one to two years, let's say. So that's kind of been my current focus as far as the distressed market. A little bit of a different twist. Um, and that's technically not a short sale, right? We're just, but it's it's still working within the distressed market. So that's kind of been the last six months or so what the focus has been. So that's creative. Anybody watching this, uh, that's creative right there. And they uh, these guys know how to execute. And that's important. I think a lot of people miss that boat. A lot of people especially when you get into the, to the realm that you're in with, with that kind of short selling and so forth. When guys get started and getting, trying to get creative, they, they just fall on their face. You got to know who you're dealing with, you know how to do it. Um, and you've always been good at executing on things, which, um, which is important in real estate investing. Now, wh where are we, where, what are you doing now to adjust to, we're obviously pushing towards the top of a cycle, right? If you have less short sales, it means we're, we're towards the top of a cycle. So, and then the cycle changes and all of a sudden short sales, you know, you have a, a ton of them coming back out. So, what are you doing now in your business and your, where you're moving to change or adapt to the market as, as we move forward? So I personally think that we're on the verge of another, I don't want to use the word crash, but I, I think at some point during this new year, based upon some people much smarter than me who, who really have their finger on the pulse, that if you follow trends and if you just follow data, you can see things moving in a certain cycle. And because we are at the quote top of the market right now, Everything from the stock market to many different indicators are saying that, you know, we're, we're being propped up with, you know, toothpicks, really. And, um, you know, the Fed has just started raising rates again. That's not going to stop. And a lot of people are predicting a downturn. Now, on a more practical level, you know, I read a lot and, you know, I like to follow different things from RealtyTrack and CoreLogic and different data sources. And I forget some of the stats, but in some of the foreclosure starts in certain pockets of the country are jumping up again rapidly. Mm. Um, homes foreclosure. So things are already starting to take a turn where they were, you know, leveled off for a while. We're on an upswing, and now it seems like things are starting to turn again. Um, of course, if you watch the news, they'll never talk about that, and everything's no. wonderful. But um, for the real people and people who are, you know, analyzing and studying this, that you can't deny that things are starting to make a little bit of a. There's trembling going on. Let's just say. So what am I doing? To answer your question. I'm focusing on the situation at hand meaning with the high equity and also with the standard ones because I know the pockets where the distress market never came back. And so there's a real need right there and we're still doing great in those pockets. But should things or when they turn again, we're positioned perfectly to, to work that market as well because we flip right back into what we've been doing for the last decade. Sure. It makes you recession proof, call it, right? That's the <laughs> People say all the time, well, you know, real estate and it's, it's so good, but I'm afraid there's going to be a crash. I said, well, if there is another crash, we're positioned perfectly to know how to address it better than before because now we have all this experience. All the systems in play, you know exactly what's going on, contact. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, that, that, that's what helps going through a full cycle. And let me ask you this, um, Brian. I know you guys are putting together a fantastic community of real estate investors and so forth. We were just talking before we jumped on here. You know, a lot of names in common that I know and you know and people in the community. What's going on there? Give me a little insight into what you guys are putting together. 
So, you know, going back to what I was telling you before, when I create the product and I did the coaching and the speaking circuit and the whole thing, it really, um, I liked it. Don't get me wrong. I got to help a lot of people and it was great, but I wanted to do something more local. I wanted to build a community here and see the thing is with most info products and you get these gurus coming into town and packing hotels and they sell them a service, a product, a coaching, whatever, but then they get on a plane and they're gone. So it leaves the people who normally spend a lot of money with no support. It's them in their home with a toll-free number to call. And that's why most people don't have success. By having a local community, by having the resources such as yourself when it comes to the money, that's what it takes to be successful in real estate investing. So we just opened up an office here on the border of New Jersey, you know, out just outside of Philadelphia. And we've got a you know, pretty decent 3,000 square foot office and we're holding weekly trainings, we're holding weekly meetings, we're, we're, we're reaching out to two different types of people. We, we, we want to work with the experienced people like we were discussing before for the primary purpose of doing deals together and doing more deals. Because one thing I've learned is no matter how successful someone gets, time eventually becomes a, a critical point, right? And you mm -hmm. can only on your own efforts do so much. But by using leverage and forming you know, strategic joint ventures, we can all do more. We can all do better. As I'm moving into multifamilies, as I'm looking at commercial properties, I'm expanding as, as myself. I'm always looking to educate myself and grow as an investor. And I don't want to just be that one trick pony, just the short sale guy. So sure. I've been doing other things and, and by working with some of, the, frankly, the nations and even the, locally, the best people around, we're forming a team that's never been formed before. Now, we're, that's for that group of people. The second group of people is for brand new people. And they want to get involved in real estate investing. They see the TV shows, right? Flip this house, love it or live. All, sure. all the, sure. But they don't know what to do. Right. And they don't want to go spend all this money, you know, to pay somebody to not have the support. So what we're introducing to them is a is a local community. And I think that's the key word. I'm building communities starting in my own backyard where we can help people become successful real estate investors regardless of where they're you know, currently starting it. Perfect. I like it. I think it's a really good idea. I know some of the people around it are really... I'll tell you what. I saw a post on Facebook with... Was Eddie Alvarez at your... Do you know yeah. who Eddie Alvarez is? He, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, was there. He really? uh, I said, I texted my buddy. I said, I saw your post. I said, is that Eddie Alvarez at one of Brian's events? He said, you know, yes. Oh my he, gosh. So. He that fight with uh, you know, Conor McGregor, of course. And sure. um, he's an investor. He, Jason knows him very well. He's a oh, local okay. investor. He's a really good guy. And uh, we're looking to get together over the next couple weeks and have lunch and uh, bring him into the community and start working with him. So if nothing else, we'll have a good bouncer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Eddie, he's a tough guy. Philly native. So yeah. Um, so Brian, everybody uh, obviously has learned a lot from this this interview with us and obviously can tell how experienced you are. Uh, a lot of people are going to have questions because you know you have a ton of knowledge. Um, we appreciate you coming on today, but I have to know, how do we get in touch with you? Somebody new, somebody experienced, how do we get in touch with Brian? Well, the best place, Ian, is my blog. So it's InvestorEntourage.com, InvestorEntourage.com, but more specifically, InvestorEntourage.com forward slash registration. Now, I, our grand opening that we held a month ago, I basically gave a speech explaining who we are, who we're looking to, to work with, how people can contact us, how they can join us, et cetera, et cetera. And so I have a replay. It's about an hour long, and it's on that specific link. So investorentourage.com forward slash registration. It's for anyone looking to you know, learn more about what we're doing and how you can possibly join us. That's perfect. I appreciate it, Brian. You guys know where to find me, Ian Walsh on Facebook, hardmoneybankers.com. Um, we're looking forward to coming to one of your community meetup meetups soon, uh, Brian, and um, appreciate it, man. Thanks for your time.